Thanks for staying with us. Joining us on the show is the Acting Managing Director of the Nigerian Ports Authority, Mohamed Bello Koko, to take us through the operations of the Nigerian Ports Authority, notably the allegations of the endemic extortion and corruption at the Apapa Ports, the congesting the Apapa Ports, making other ports viable, encouraging non-oil exports, and so on. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's been four months since you took over leadership at the MPA. How has it been for you? Oh, um, so don't forget that I have been part of the executive management of Nigerian Post Authority. Um, I've been issued before I was made the acting managing director. So it has been easier to actually uh, fill in that position and uh, see to the operations of Nigerian Post Authority. Mm. Um, what I did was to look at the mandate of Nigerian Post Authority, which are basically to ensure the smooth operation of the ports and ensure, you know, um, easy evacuation of cargo, and then revenue generation, mm. trade facilitation, and so on and so forth. And we picked those mandates and I ensured that we followed up to ensure that um, we have moved from where we are to at least a better position mm. since I assumed about uh, position. All right, sir. You know, we can, you know that Papa gridlock, a Papa issue is a major problem in Nigeria right now. Mm. And so simply, what is the plan to decongest a Papa? Okay, so let me first of all explain what is happening in a Papa and the thing can exist. If you remember, uh, recently, Nigerian Post Authority deployed what we call an ETO app, and we created a truck uh, transit park. Mm -hmm. um, the essence here was to ensure that trucks that are coming into the port actually go into that park before they get to the port. Mm -hmm. We have about 27, 29 satellite truck parks. All trucks are supposed to go into those parks, mm -hmm. and from those parks, they are not supposed to be called into what we call a pre-gate. So there are some parks that are pre-gates. Pre-gate means from that location, you now move into the ports. Mm -hmm. The essence here is to streamline the movement of trucks, streamline cargo evacuation in and out of it. Now, out of the 29 or so truck parks, um, probably about seven or eight of them have deployed the physical infrastructure that are needed. This includes bollards, it includes uh, internet deployment, that is IT deployment. It also includes automated uh, gate control system. What we have discovered is that some of the trucks do not go to those parks. So for instance, there's a manifest system. Mm -hmm. Terminal A, B, and C need a certain number of trucks to come in. Mm -hmm. So that means when you log in and you have your ATO ticket, if you are at the parks, you will automatically be called over to come into those locations. Mm -hmm. So where the trucks are bypassing that is where we have a problem. But currently I can say that if you look at the uh, Tinkan Mile 2 axis, that is where the major problem is. Mm -hmm. But the Apapa Ijora part of the corridor is more smooth. We can say that 80% is better. You can ask people living in Apapa, there is better in and out there. But the Tinkan Apapa uh, the, the Tinkan Corridor to, uh, to Mile 2 is a major problem. Mm -hmm. One of so the reasons there is the road network, mm -hmm. which is currently being reconstructed. Okay. Yes, so and some of the physical infrastructure has not been deployed by TTP yet. So I live around that um, axis of town, Mile 2, Amod of area, and I see trucks constantly parked. On Friday last week, I couldn't even get out of Amod of a to Osho the Apapa Expressway on the other side to walk because... A papa thing can have started again. And people constantly worry that, you know, there have been interventions, tax forces, and all of this, despite all of the efforts of government from federal to state, something is happening on that axis that is defying every solution. One of the major allegations also is that there's a large level of corruption. We had the tax force um, chairperson for truck drivers or some, I think, truckers yeah. on the show last week. We also had a professor of transportation on the show, and all of them were able to establish this. What have you found as the, you know, MD now? What have you found to be the realities there? And what are you doing exactly? Whether are you working with them to combat, to deal with this? Or what exactly is the plan to deal with Maltu, Tinkan, Axis? Okay, so... First of all, let's identify that the problem with mile two 
thing can exist is first of all the road itself. Between Sunrise mm -hmm. and Mr. Biggs, the road is terrible. Mm -hmm. We have held meetings with the Director of Works uh, of Federal Ministry of Works and Housing. We have also held a meeting with uh, Dangote High Tech to see if they can provide palliative works at those locations. If they do that, the flow of traffic will be better. But we accept that there is massive issues of corruption and extortion yeah. along that corridor. Now, I have taken bikes, that's Okada, at night, in the afternoon, three, four times I have done it, probably up to six times, because I wanted to see what was happening for myself. I wanted to, I, don't, I didn't want someone to report to me what was happening. And what I discovered were multiple checkpoints, ad hoc checkpoints mm -hmm. that were not supposed to be there. Okay. And therefore, because there are those checkpoints, um, there are issues of extortion. And what mm -hmm. we are seeing is, this is done by virtually everybody. Uniformed men, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, police, military, navy, a lot of, virtually everyone is involved. So it's not just one government agency that is involved in this. Mm. What we have done was to call a meeting of all the agencies and plead with them to first of all identify what checkpoints should be in place. Mm -hmm. So on that axis, if we identify five, six checkpoints, it means any other checkpoint outside the identified checkpoints is illegal. Mm -hmm. But then what are the checkpoints supposed to be doing also? They are not supposed to interfere with the free flow of traffic. They are supposed to check the ATO tickets mm -hmm. and be sure that so the truck that is at point B is supposed to be there. It's supposed to, it would have gotten probably its ATO ticket before it gets there. And if it doesn't, you, you send it backwards. And that's what we have been doing. We have held meetings with the truck drivers themselves. One of the major problems is also some of the truck drivers in their bid to hurry up and get into the port actually get on the queue without the TDO being ready. Mm -hmm. So they'll be on the queue, they are waiting to get approval to get into the port. So, the so they, don't, they don't even move. They slow down their movement, thereby creating a lot of traffic, traffic at the yes. back. We also discovered truck drivers. There's a building somewhere around uh, a papa uh, gate where you can actually go into, and in probably 15, 20 minutes, you get a brand new plate number that you will use along with your ATO ticket. Mm. So there have been theft of ATO tickets. Yes. And what we have done was to ask that instead of numbers or figures, let the ATO uh, ticket turn to a barcode. Mm -hmm. It means yeah. that when you have a barcode, you will scan it and you'll be able to move to, yeah. to the next level. But I want to thank the various agencies of government and the Lagos State government in particular. Mm -hmm. The Lagos State governor has taken personal interest in what is happening in Tinka mm -hmm. and Apapa. <laughs> um, the, minister for, uh, the Minister of Transport also has paid personal interest in what is going on. He, mm -hmm keeps calling permanently, he goes there quietly and checks what is going on. Lagos State Government has been in collaboration with NPA mm -hmm. to provide enforcement. Enforcement here is to ensure that mm -hmm. trucks are not parked along the road, you know, illegally and so on and so forth. So Sorry we are having stakeholder collaborations. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, for the ETO call-up system, there's been a, I don't know how to put it. Let's just call it corruption again of, you know, like you admitted, issuing numbers and people generating numbers for a select number of tro uh, main players in, the, on, in this uh, industry. So some people have up to 100 trucks and they secure their people. They have insiders who also sabotage the system for select few. This can be investigated. Mm. According to the truck um, chair, uh, tax force chairperson when he came here, mm. they discovered even an account where they were paying an 11000 uh, amount to that you, they presented to you. All these have been investigated. Can there be consequences okay. within that system? Can people with names be mentioned and punished to deter Persecuted. continuity? Okay, so mm. let me first of all comment on what you just said. Mm. The accounts that we're talking about, so the ETO system is made like this. You are supposed to, as an importer, first of all, you, the, uh, the truck owner, you are supposed to register. We have over 80,000 trucks. Mm. registered on a two platform. Mm -hmm. We created and ensured that there should be a minimum safety standard for these trucks. But out of the 80,000, probably only 16,000 have met the uh, minimum safety standard. Mm. Now you're supposed to go into that uh, app and book a truck that should carry your container, okay? So when you do that, that means you already have a deal. And when you have that deal, it means that you will be on schedule to come in. Mm. You will be manifested that means there is a manifest on who should come in and who should not come in. Okay. Now, we discovered that the truck drivers are not able to use the app themselves. 
So they found oh. people by the roadside that have ATM machines. So they pay them, and then these people now pay the money to TTP, which is the company managing ETO. Mm -hmm. So you now see where that allegation is coming from. Mm -hmm. But we have called them and had a meeting with them and said, you know what, you need to learn this thing. This thing is on your phone. It's an app. You should be able to pay for your ETO charges so that you don't, because what they do is they pay someone to pay ETO and they also pay charges mm. to that person. Extra. Okay. They, pay, they pay extra to, to that person. The account is also registered in the name ETO or TTP because what... what yes, so, so let's assume much. you are the person that collects the funds mm -hmm. on behalf of TTP. You will now mm -hmm. transfer to TTP in order to get the ETO ticket. And that's what has been happening. Uh, it has been investigated. We call the, uh, the we have a marine department, marine police, and we have spoken with our uh, AIG, and he has investigated. And that's when we discovered that this was what was happening. Mm. The truck drivers, we have told them they need to come together and understand this. There have been a lot of, you know, uh, uh, meetings with them. We have sensitized them on how to use this app. The power is in their hands, and they should be able to Jeez. use this app. So one of the um you know, things some experts have said, if we want to really decongest the papa pots, for instance, is to find a way to encourage uh, other people to use other pots like the ones in Rivers and Delta. Is there any plan of the MPA to probably reduce their tariff as a way of incentive for them to use other pots and also get those pots ready? Okay, so I want to take the issue of the Eastern pots from three, 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 you know, perspectives. First of all, a bit of a history on those pots and then what is the problem with those pots? And then what we are doing about it. Okay. Um, some, so the, the, the Calabar, uh, Worry, and um, Brew 2 pots were, in, so many years ago, were being managed by private mercantile companies, enterprises. And in 1969, the federal government of Nigeria uh, came up with a decree they called nationalization of private mm -hmm. uh, 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 pots. And that enabled Nigerian Port Authority to take over the management of Calabar, Wari, and Brutu Ports. Nigerian Port Authority then paid about 3.1 million naira to take over these ports. Mm. Now, those that located these ports located them far away from the ocean. Oh. Wari Port is about 109 kilometers away from the starting of the channel. That is the fairway boy. Calabar Port is about 101 kilometers away. That means the channel is 101 kilometers. Mm -hmm. River Spot is about 90 kilometers. Okay. Meanwhile, Lagos Spot is just about 9.25 kilometers. Mm. So that means they have a geographical disadvantage. Okay. And because of the distance of the ports, there is a high siltation along the channel. Now, that siltation means it becomes more expensive to maintain them because there are so many tributaries and distributaries. But let me take the worry port, for instance. The problem with Wari Port, first of all, so all these locations in the East have one major issue, two issues. First is the geopolitical, dis uh, ge geographical disadvantage, and then security issues. Oh. In Lagos, you can move vessels in and out of the port any time of the day, any time of the night. The Eastern Port, there is a window. Between a certain time in the morning and in the afternoon, you can move vessels out of port or into port. After that, our pilots cannot go for security reasons. Mm. So that limits time. Well. Yes, and it affects efficiency at those locations also. The second issue for, let's say, for worry now, worry currently, there is a breakwater. A breakwater is a physical infrastructure that is built in the ocean to reduce siltation and reduce the effect of uh, uh, waves, ocean waves, into the channel. Mm. That physical infrastructure is about 8.5 kilometers lo long, and it collapsed probably nine, 10 years ago. It has not been rebuilt. On what we are doing on Wari, we are currently doing a bathymetric survey and geo geotechnical survey by Royal Hasconi. And after that survey, they will come up with a proper design to either reconstruct the existing physical infrastructure, that's the breakwater, or to build a new one. So Wari also has a pipe, an NNPC pipe, that is about seven meters under. That means you cannot dredge Wari deeper than seven meters. But these days, because of economies of scale, everybody wants to bring in bigger vessels. Yeah. If you go to Riversport, Riversport is very old. In fact, it has reached its end of year life. Riversport is supposed to either be reconstructed or a new one is supposed to be constructed. Calabar Port also, because of the distance and the lapidation and also, and dredging hasn't been taking place. But what have we done now? First of all, let me, know, let me state it that 
Nigerian Post Authority is not in a position to decide for a consignee where to take his goods to. Oh. Yes. They are the ones that take that decision. They are private mm -hmm. businesses. They are private businesses. But what we have done was to provide incentives, tariff relief mm -hmm. at those eastern ports, so that shipping lines and importers can also send in their goods, their cargo into those ports. So probably if you are bringing in something into Lagos ports, and at the end of the day, the total is a million with what we are giving, and you are paying probably five, six hundred thousand at the eastern ports. Maybe it will encourage people to bring in their cargo into those. But we have seen an increase in importation in those locations, and I think in the next few weeks we will also review that tariff and see if we can bring so, it so down. So based on what you've said now, sorry, yeah, can I go? Go please. Okay, so you know, just a quick uh, follow up to this. My question will be, um, even though we understand you cannot determine for um, importers and exporters where, which ports they should use, but considering the congestion at the Apapa port, what is the federal government and NPA considering long term? Is it that this will eventually be fixed? And it, does it cost so much money that you do not think it will be fixed within two, mm -hmm. three years? Is there a timeline that you're looking at and saying, okay, we need to raise funds and then give us like a five-year period or a 10-year period to make sure these ports are mm -hmm. up and going? So let me state first of all that the ports in Lagos have reached their capacity. They are operating far beyond their installed capacity. Okay. The city has caught up with the ports. There is no space to expand those ports. Mm -hmm. However, the Minister of Transportation has increasingly encouraged the Nigerian Ports Authority, and that discussion has started to look at how to reconstruct the ports. Uh, there is a limitation in terms of the depth of the, of the key walls. Mm -hmm. the, the, the design there at the key walls is maximum of uh, about 13. So that means you cannot also dredge the channel deeper than 13 meters. And because of that, that has mm -hmm. reduced, or is we are not able to bring bigger vessels into those locations. So there is discussion currently between Nigerian Port Authority and the terminal operators to find alternative sources to rebuild those ports. Now, rebuilding is not just the physical infrastructure, okay. the IT system, mm. the equipment. Currently, there is the no port in Nigeria that has a ship-to-ship -ship crane, whereby you pick mm -hmm. a container, <coughs> you understand. Uh, mm. Yeah, so you understand. So. We are ensuring that that is being done. And we are also looking for, we have started discussion with other multilateral, multilateral financial agencies mm -hmm. that are likely to provide funding mm -hmm. for development of these ports. The other alternative is for the terminal operators to build the ports and then we amortize over time. So do we have a timeline? So this has already started mm -hmm. and we believe that in the next two years maximum, these ports should have been reconstructed. But okay. don't also forget finally, the Lake Deep Seaport mm. will come on stream next year. That is going to be a game changer. It's going to have a minimum draft of 16.5 meters, which no port location has in Nigeria. It's going to bring in a lot of trade into the country. Currently, we have a lot of ship-to-ship -ship businesses offshore okay. in neighboring countries, and we believe Lake Deep Seaport will take over that business. All right, the sir. Badagri Port too is going to come on stream. Okay. So these are the, 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 the plans. All right. Let's uh, take a breather now. When we come back, this conversation continues. Thanks for staying with us. Miriam had a question. Follow up. Yes. Um, follow up on what you just said. As exciting as it is to have a new port in the Lekki area and you know, the impact it have on our economy, I'm sure the residents of Lekki are, you know, are listening and thinking, so what is happening to the residents in Apapa will be brought to our area? What is the plan to make sure that this does not cause the chaos in Lekki that is causing right now in Apapa? So the difference between Lekki and the ports in Tinkana and Apapa is already there is a plan in terms of development of the road network in that, in that, in that area. Um, don't forget Lekki is owned by a private investor, mm -hmm. Lagos State Government, and then the federal mm -hmm. government represented by Nigerian Post Authority. Mm -hmm. And then I know that there is already a plan to design a rail system that will terminate at the port. That will help in evacuation of cargo. So, the problem you have here in Lake in, in Tinkan and Apapa is because it's a very old location that has not been any proper town yes, planning. But there's a proper town planning, and I know that the Lagos State Government is very serious as, about developing the road network there. Uh, the cargo doesn't need to come into town. I was made to understand that it's a road they could take into Shagamu and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's not going to happen. We held a meating with Lake Deep Sea Port about two weeks ago, okay. and it was one of the issues that uh, was discussed and was addressed. And the Lagos State Governor is very keen in ensuring that the road network in Lekki 
so is resolved. Quickly, what happened to Ikorodu Port? I think it was abandoned. I, I need clarity on that. And also, if there are private investors collaborating with government on LTS in Lagos, what is the problem with Akere Dolu's proposed deep sea port in Ondo, mm -hmm. which will of course take care of a large traffic on roads mm -hmm. heading towards, you know, the southeast. Okay, so um, let me take the issue of the port in, uh, in, in the Ikorodu. Ikorodu wasn't abandoned. Ikorodu is a lighter terminal. That means big vessels cannot come there. There is a limitation in terms of the draft. Mm. But it was now designated to be a location for overtime cargo. Okay. And overtime cargo, <laughs> let's just assume any cargo that has spent more than 90 days at the port is supposed to be uh, uh, taken to Ikorodu, or is supposed to be declared by the terminal operator and then taken to Ikorodu. But Ikorodu mm -hmm. is currently filled up. We have probably over three or 4,000 containers in Ikorodu. It didn't start now. Uh, the issue of congestion in Ikorodu itself has been there for so long, probably for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. We have written to the CG Customs, and we appreciate the efforts it's making in auctioning the containers currently in Ikorodu. I also know that there are over 1,000 vehicles in Ikorodu. So we need those to be auctioned up for us to also take out the overtime cargo that are currently at various port locations into Ikorodu. Mm -hmm. um, I know that auctioning has begun, but mm -hmm. we please plead that it should be hastened up so that that mm -hmm. port will be free, and then that location will be free, and then the other overtime cargo at the other port locations cannot be pulled out and taken to Ikorodu to create more space at the ports of Tinkan and Apapa. For the other question, Undo, um, so there was a proposal between Ondo and Ogun State to create a, a, a port. Both states agreed to do that. And then we are now seeing a situation whereby one of the states want to break away and create another port location. And we have encouraged them to come up with an agreement between themselves, whether each of them wants to create a separate port, which is what we are seeing. But what we are seeing is it's not economically viable for the two states to have two different deep sea ports. The proximity is too close. And all the economic indices, the financial model has shown that it is not viable to have those two ports. Mm. This decision should not be a political decision. It should be an economic decision in the best interest of both states, mm -hmm. and Nigeria in particular. Okay. We know that the OBC for those ports has already been done. We are studying it. We have reached an advanced stage, and very soon um, a conclusion will be reached. OK, let's the... take this call from Hassan. Good morning, Hassan. Oh, it's from Lekki. <laughs> to the acting managing director of Nigeria Port Authority, hmm. uh, I have two questions for you, Coco. Uh, number one is about the clean law in Abama, the corruption that led to the green law in Apapa. And the principal people that have come up to this, number one, the police, the army, FBA security, the last man, road safety, these are the principal culprits. What are you doing now to checkmate the FBA security? Your for you, because a lot of people are having problems in accessing the port due to, due to the corruption of the personnel of MPA. Is that all, sir? Okay, can you respond? Okay, okay so um, like you mentioned, the issue of extortion, so there's a team. The team, the team involves... The team set up by Lagos State Government, which involves LASMA, the police, and then you have MPA staff. For us, discipline, when it comes to such issues, we take it very seriously. Mm. There was an incident we investigated and we identified six persons, six security staff of Nigerian Post Authority, and we have taken measures against them. And we will keep doing that. We will mm. keep investigating. We are thinking of using other digital ways. Because you see, when you say someone collected money, they have evolved so much now that it's the area boys that stand on the road to collect money while the uniformed men and others are standing and by, by the side. side. Wow. Mm. So if you accuse someone, the onus is on you to prove it. Mm. Okay. So we have taken measures. But I also know that when it comes to the police, we have written to the IG. 
the IG has promised to take the adequate measures and other uniformed uh, security agencies. We have also submitted a list of police officers that we have found to be consistently involved in the extortion along that corridor to the Lagos State Governor. He has that list and he has promised to take action adequately. Mm -hmm. What we realize is there are police officers that, as if their umbilical cord has been buried in that location. Thank you. They have refused to leave that location. Mm -hmm. wow. And we have pleaded with the IG that he should please redeploy those officers. Yes. Yeah. And he has promised to take action. The other problem we have is the issue of jurisdiction. We have marine police. Their jurisdiction ends within the port corridor. Mm -hmm. Anything outside that, they cannot act on it. Mm -hmm. And we have pleaded that that jurisdictional issue should be amended in such a way that when there are issues on the road in front of our ports, the police that are you know, attached to the uh, Nigerian Ports Authority, that's the Marine Police, should be able to take action. We have a CP. You understand? Mm -hmm. CP Marine, he's there. We have a port. There's the a possibility <laughs> of collaboration with the, the Marine Police and the guys on the, so, so the, so, on the road. So the issue here is, as long as he has jurisdiction outside and there's a problem outside, we'll hold him responsible. But if something happens outside, you are reporting to the CP Lagos. The CP Lagos does not report to Nigerian Post Authority. He mm. reports to the IG and the yeah. Lagos State Governor. The Lagos State Governor, in a certain meeting, has called the CP police to say, listen, this is what I need you to do. We need to dismantle all these checkpoints. We need to ensure that those who have spent too long mm. at those locations be moved out. Some have been redeployed, but some are still there. Yeah. And we are pleading for this. The extortion in that corridor is massive. And it's ad hoc. You just wake up and you see 20, 30 checkpoints along that corridor mm. instead okay. of three or four or five. All right, sir. Let me ask you how long it takes to process export of goods outside the country. Because a lot of exporters and importers are complaining that they're losing money every day with their goods stuck at the ports and nothing Lots is being done. So how long is it supposed to take? How long does it really take to clear and to export? Um, on assumption of duty as acting managing director of Nigerian Post Authority, one of the first things I did after, you know, looking at what ETO is doing and how to improve it is to look at exports. I am more interested in export of commodities than the import. It's not that the import, we're an import dependent economy, yes. but mm. exports will improve and help our GDP. Yeah. Yeah. And we looked at it and realized that some of the exporters actually do not finish processing their documents before they come to the port. Oh. So that means they are on the queue, they are slowing down. Some of them are also um, exporting illegal items. So they are waiting until a certain person is at the gate before to he gets there. Pass. Mm. And then, but to be candid, there are also delays in that. What have we done? What we have done is we just uh, a few weeks ago uh, actually created an export processing terminal in Lily Pond. The essence of that is actually to support the President Muhammadu Buhari's government. Uh, policy on diversification of the economy and improvement of non-oil exports. Those parks, that particular park is supposed to have an internationally you know, uh, accredited uh, facility where you have the ability to process, mm. to package, to sort, and then you close the container from there and straight to the port. So it means that the, 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 that location will be able to just, you just finish your documentation and everything. So there will be customs, all government agencies will be there. And then recently, we have also advertised for people to express interest. We want to establish 10 of those export processing terminals. Mm. There will be cooling rooms and so on and so forth because of perishable export items. commodities and items. And then we will ensure that the speed at which these exports are processed and taken into the ports is actually very fast. Uh, some of the exporters don't even finish you know, filling their NXP forms before they come to the ports. Mm. And then one major problem, let's assume a vessel is coming on the 15th of a month. The exporters actually at times get to the port on the first or second or third of the month. Of the month, wow. So the shipping companies are saying, no, you cannot come in until the ship has arrived so that we will load your container immediately. Mm. You understand? That way you are not occupying space at the port. So it's a cycle of issues. What we need to keep doing is re-engage them and encourage them to ensure that their documents are complete and so on and so forth. We will give priority to exports. Mm -hmm. We are reviewing what is going on. ETO is a live app. So <laughs> anything you do, you are tweaking the current system. Let me explain something. The whole of that is a cycle. So in that cycle, you have the truckers, you have the importers, you have the exporters, you have the community living around Tinkan and Apapa. Anything you tweak can actually 
affect the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. So you need to be careful how you are amending these things. And gradually, we are amending it. We are coming up with policies that will ensure that when you, they call it reverse booking, mm -hmm. we are going to test run it. Mm -hmm. When a truck goes into the port to drop container, you should be able to book a deal to pick out a container mm -hmm. so it doesn't out come of the out port. Empty. So it doesn't come out empty. So that will reduce uh, all that. So Let me finally say this, please. A2, that was truck in and out of about 21,570 trucks in May. By last month, what we had was about 53,640 trucks in and out. Mm -hmm. That shows a tremendous increase okay. in the number of trucks that are going in We're and out of out. the port. Yeah. Can we do better? Yes, we can actually double that. You understand? And we are working on that. Okay. So recently, um, there's a, an MOA you signed the Nigerian Court of Law Port Operation. Of what significance is that? So um, the agreement with the MOU with, um, with uh, the, the port of Abidjan mm -hmm. is more like a, you know, multilateral agreement between, that we are trying to create between Nigeria Port Authority, the port of Abidjan, and other ports in Africa. Mm -hmm. There are very few direct port-to-port sea -port link between those two countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a bigger country. We have more ports than Abidjan or, or than, than Ivory Coast. So this is to create a relationship between the two. There are learning points from them, and there are learning points from us. And also it's to increase trade facilitation between both countries. And there uh, is a commitment to also work together uh, where there are deficiencies in Nigeria that we believe we can learn from the port of Cote d'Ivoire. We will go and learn it and bring it back here, and vice versa also. Mm. And so that's the essence of that um, MOU that we have with them. So what are you doing about Ponde Terminals mm -hmm. now? Because I live in Satellite Town and Satellite B, the entire area, the environmental, mm -hmm. down to Irede, you have trucks packed anyhow. And when they are ready to take over the roads, the uh, people, the, uh, you know, the people living there are subjected to what, worse hardship you can, than you can imagine. I live there, I live through it. That's my reality. What exactly do you plan to do? What, uh, what's the regulation for them? Why are we trying to decongest Papa and then they're congesting all the roads? And the state of the road, who is speaking for that area? What exactly is happening? Um, I cannot speak about the state of the road there. Mm -hmm. That is actually mm -hmm. outside my, my pay grade. Let me mm -hmm. use that word. But for the bonded terminals, some of them actually have badge licenses also. And we are encouraging them to use badges. That is one of the things we have introduced to reduce congestion in all the port locations. Mm -hmm. And we are really, really encouraged to see the amount of cargo that is being moved by those, uh, by, by, through the cargo. So we are looking at what the, the activities of the bonded terminals. If there is need for us to request that some of them relocate from some areas, we are ready to do that. Mm. Discussions have started. We are calling them as stakeholders also. And we are looking at their activities and when do the trust get in, when do they come out, and so on and so forth. That discussion is taking place. And I believe that within this so month, you'll see some of them. Why do we take complaints? Because I have names of some of them. Why do we take complaints of their activities to? Mm. You can give it to me if you want right now. But actually, if you go to MPA <laughs> website, it's an interactive website. Oh, we have a, we take it, take, take it from me. We have, we have a Savicom department that, on a daily basis, looks at complaints being lodged, mm. inquiries also. Mm. And there's a GM responsible for that. And we need to encourage <clears> people to lay in their complaints, that. you understand? And we will review them. And we'll get back to you. Yeah. That is taken for granted. All right, one final okay. question, sir. Yeah, so we have someone who sent a uh, message. It says, as a farmer, what consideration is given to people importing agricultural produce if they have to stay on the queue for too long? Is there any consideration given to them, especially as we understand the per, um, perishable how, goods? Yes, yes. Did he say importing goods. or exporting? Importing. importing. So is this is this is the same thing also? The same. Uh, so we give windows for trucks to get into the port and come out of the port. Some will go in between one in the morning to say three in the morning, so on and so forth. So we give uh, consideration to reefers, to trucks that go in to bring fish and other things at the port. We do not delay those ports. Their window is very important because we know that in a few hours, in a few days, those goods will actually expire. And that has been going on. And I'm sure if he looks at it, he'll see that there has been a tremendous improvement uh, in terms of um, 
access to the ports mm -hmm. by importers of perishable mm -hmm. items. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with the Acting Managing Director of the Nigeria Ports Authority, Mohamed Belokoko. Thank you for giving us a wonderful explanation of everything that has been happening. Nima, are you okay? <laughs> are you satisfied? My own is not satisfied. I'm telling you, not satisfied. <laughs> not satisfied. Okay, maybe he needs to come more I'll and come give more. us yeah, a breakdown of everything that's happening. That's all we can take on the show today. Join us again next week. And happy Independence Day. We'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye.